NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. So I was already, I prepared something in advance, and I was all ready to start with this joke about uh, law enforcement officers ramming the heads of uh, suspects into the door frame of cars. But then I realized this is probably not the audience for <laughs> that particular joke. Um, but, um, and then I was, I was wondering why the heck Cynthia invited me to this, because I've, I've actually spent the vast majority of my career as a prosecutor. Um, so I decided that, you know, she's going to give me the microphone and, and, and allow me this opportunity to speak to you. I'm going to talk about the, the topic that I care about the most, and that's me. <laughs> so I grew up in State College, Pennsylvania. Um, some of you are shaking your heads. You've heard of it before. Some of you are like, who the hell named the town State College? Um, that happens to be where Penn State University is. And some of you may also know its other name, which is Happy Valley. And um, as my parents regularly said, uh, they didn't interview any of the black people there. Um, so it would not have taken all that long to interview the black people there. I, I graduated in a class of about 600, and there were uh, 10 black kids in that graduating class. Um, and so my first look at a real experience beyond my, my family uh, and a couple members of the Penn State football team of, of, of what it meant to be black was uh, the news. And for some reason, in State College, Pennsylvania, they got the New York City news. And for those of you old enough to remember, the New York City news or one of the stations always started off, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? that would immediately be followed by black young man shot dead, by black young man arrested for a particular crime, by a black young man or family in poverty. And that's what I, as a young black man, saw every single night leading off the news at 10 o'clock. And it was at that moment that I kind of realized that what I wanted to do most was to change that because, as President Obama said when he visited El Reno prison, first sitting president to visit a, a federal prison or a prison at all, was, you know, but for the grace of God go I. There was nothing about me that prevented me from being one of those black boys other than the fact that I lived in one of those communities that was particularly forgiving. And so I immediately decided that I was going to be a public defender. That's what I was going to do. And my last summer before the end of my undergraduate uh, year, uh, my senior year in undergraduate, I was an investigator for the public defender service. And then I got to law school and I, I, I made fun of a professor who worked for the Department of Justice because I said, you can't really be about justice and work for the Department of Justice. And so my first summer I worked for the Federal Defender of Chicago as a law clerk. And then my second summer I decided, let me, let me, you know, let me look into the civil rights thing. And I went into my interview and because I, I'm always so well prepared for all of my interviews, I, I went into my interview and, I'm, and the person's like, well, what section do you want to be in in the Civil Rights Division? And I said, oh, I don't know, education, employment, voting. And she said, what about the criminal section? I said, what the hell is the criminal section? I'd never heard of it. And she said, it's the group that goes around the country prosecuting police misconduct, police brutality, and hate crimes. And I said, that would be awesome. <laughs> And despite my lack of preparation for the interview, she gave me the offer, and I ended up as a line attorney in the Civil Rights Division. 
Well, I got to the civil rights division as a line attorney, and my boss says, you have to go to the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office and prosecute cases. Well, that's the one thing I didn't want to do. Because everyone knows in D.C. the people who get prosecuted are young black men. But he's like, you don't know anything about being a prosecutor. You need to go there and be a prosecutor. And so I, I got there, and I said, and, and, and I, I did a couple cases, and I, I started to realize I had complete control of my docket. I could do largely what I wanted to do with all these cases. Then I got my first jury trial ever. My first jury trial ever, and in that courtroom was a black prosecutor, a black defense attorney, a black defendant, a black court clerk, a black bailiff, a black judge, all in this one courtroom. And that told me just how much race matters. Now, I keep hearing over and over again that we have the greatest justice system in the world. And I, I, I'm not any kind of professor of international law. I haven't done any surveys. But I have, con I have a, just a few concerns if this is, in fact, the greatest. <laughs> so I, I start thinking, okay, well, it must be the greatest because we have this adversarial system. That, 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 that must be what people mean. But then I thought about it a little bit, and I realized, well, how much of the adversarial system actually happens when prosecutors can charge ridiculous numbers of crimes, forcing a defense attorney to recommend to their client, look, I could risk this, and you can go to jail for 30 years, or we could take a plea, and you'll be out in three. I'm not sure that the adversarial system is working the way it should be when, when, when we have that. And, and then you also have the fact that public defenders and other defense attorneys have dockets that are so large that there's no way for them to possibly defend all their clients the way that they want to defend them. And then, of course, you have the words of Brian Stevenson, that it is better to be rich and guilty. I mean, rich and, uh, rich and guilty than to be poor and innocent. So... I guess it's not the adversarial system. You know what? It must be because we are so good in this country at solving crime. Okay, that, that's got to be why we are the greatest system. Do you know that right now we have about a 61% clearance rate on homicides? Do you know that in Detroit, that number is 32%? And in Flint, that number is 17%. But there are all these convictions. So who's getting convicted? Oh, well, sorry, that's the poor people who can't afford to get themselves out of jail. And we know this. We've heard the statistic, 2.2 million people currently incarcerated. Well, do you know that of that 2.2 million people, 700,000 of those people are in jails, not prisons, in jails. And about 500,000 of those people haven't been convicted of anything. That's who's filling our prisons and jails right now. So it must be that we are the greatest because of the way we treat our young people. But we are suspending and expelling young people in the millions every year. We know for a fact that young black boys as young as four are being expelled from school because they what? Behave like a four-year-old. Mark Maurer, who you're going to hear from later, just released a, uh, a report based on a DOJ study that points out that right now, 
black boys are five times as likely to be incarcerated in a juvenile facility than a white boy. And in six states, it is 10 times as likely. You know, as Kristen Henning wrote uh, in Angela Davis's amazing book, Policing the Black Man, we live in a society that is uniquely afraid of black boys. So maybe it's not the way we treat our young people. So it's got to be because law enforcement doesn't get it wrong that often. But I looked a little bit and, and I, I noticed that a thousand people are shot and killed by law enforcement every year. You know, I thought about the fact that a young white student at Michigan, and I just picked a random school where the football coach gets seven million a year, which may say something about how we value things, is going to get nothing for possessing the same drugs that a young black boy is going to get jail time for. And then, I thought about Sandra Bland, and Walter Scott, and Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, and Laquan McDonald. Seems like law enforcement gets it wrong sometimes. So then maybe, just maybe, because I'm, I'm really digging now, I'm really searching for why this is the greatest. And maybe it's because we are so good at making sure that our law enforcement has such a phenomenal relationship with its communities. <laughs> and again, going to Angela Davis's book, you should see the stories at the start of that from, uh, from Professor Kristen Henning for the contempt of cop arrests that we all know happen all so often. Young arrestee gets his face beaten in and gets charged with resisting arrest. But you know what, maybe it's because now law enforcement can get an endless supply of military weapons. Thanks, AG Sessions, that's a, that's a good one. Or maybe it's because now, increasingly, law enforcement can forfeit property from someone who is convicted of absolutely nothing. Or maybe it's because we know that black people and brown people are over-policed for that horrible crime of jaywalking, also known as Ferguson, and many other communities, and under-policed for the things that they care about the most. So maybe it's not our relationship with our law enforcement in our communities. But we treat those folks who get incarcerated really well, right? I mean, let's ignore the fact that our federal prisons are 38% black and 33% Latino, because that's you know, pretty close to their population in the United States. And Let's ignore the fact that we lock people up for years and years and decades when we have no idea whether locking someone up for any length of time has any value whatsoever on our public safety. And of course, we would never, not in this great nation, misuse solitary confinement. Khalif Browder. And we would never have a death penalty that treats people differently based on their race and their income level, would we? So speaking of that, just a random aside, I happen to have the honor of representing State Attorney RMS Ayala, who announced that she was not going to seek the death penalty anymore because 
It does not improve public safety. It does not improve law enforcement safety. It costs millions and millions of dollars. It does not provide the family with any closure. Those are the primary reasons she listed. The governor decided that she was wrong. We argued in front of the Florida Supreme Court and lost. But the one thing that never came up in any of the pleadings was the fact that she was right. Never came up. The governor didn't argue it. The, the attorney general didn't argue it. The court didn't mention it. The legislature sure as hell didn't mention it. And she didn't even mention race. So it must be because we are such a forgiving society and once you've done your time, you're good to go. Right? We're going to help you to succeed. There was a study done early on in the Obama administration that found, I believe it was somewhere in the neighborhood of, somewhere in the millions, I believe, of collateral consequences for having a, a record. As Cynthia got that award, I remembered that President Obama gave clemency to about 1,700 people and pardoned about another 200. And you wouldn't believe the criticism we got for that. Again, remember, 2.2 million people incarcerated. We got about 2,000 who got earlier release. And then you have this administration, this pardoning, and a complete racist. And I was looking for those voices again, and those voices were awfully silent. So I'm, I'm still, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm like, I'm figuring out, okay, this is why we are the greatest justice system in the world. And part of it's got to be because we're so data-driven. And I see my friend Harlan Yu here. We are data-driven in this country, Harlan. I mean, we don't, we don't make any decisions unless we have the facts to support it. <laughs> then I remembered, I, I used to do hate crimes work. I still try to do a little bit when I can. And I, I was thinking about the numbers. So who do we go to when we want to know the, the truth about something? We go to our FBI and we go to the Uniform Crime Report because those are the numbers. So according to those numbers, in 2015, because of course we don't have up-to-date numbers because that would be too hard, California had a little over 1,000 hate crimes. New York, a little over 500 hate crimes. Alabama, 12. Mississippi, zero. It's pretty cool that we've solved the hate crimes problem <laughs> in the South. I mean, I, I saw that chart you showed earlier. I mean, clearly that was old, an old chart. These Confederate statues are doing a heck of a job removing and ending hate crimes in America. So, I say all this, you know, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, somewhat jokingly, but these are the things that, when I was a part of the Obama administration, we were fighting for. We were fighting for all these things. And, and look, I'm not going to debate with any of you that we've made as much progress as we probably could have made. I think we could have made more. But he always talked about the arc of the moral universe bending toward justice. And I think we bent it a little bit. But what is stunning to me as I sit here watching this nonsense happening in my city right now is how we're not just bending it a little bit backward. We have broken it. I mean, the conference's name is Race Matters, and it is clear to me that to this administration, the race that matters most is white, and the second one is this new race. I'm just learning about this blue race. <laughs> that I, I, I was not familiar with before, but I'm getting to know more and more about. So 
you've been talked at for a long time, and, and everything I'm saying, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm truly preaching to the choir here when I speak to, to folks like you who, who are in the trenches, who are working this, who, who are trying to, trying to change things, trying to make things better, trying to fight for your clients. So what... I'll, what I can do is, is maybe give you a couple thoughts on what it is that you can do. And the number one thing to do is to resist and to keep on resisting and to keep on fighting. Because sadly, those in the criminal defense community, and, and you have probably lost more battles than you have won. And you pick yourselves up and you go back into that courtroom again and you fight again for your client. Well, that same perseverance, that same grit is what all of America needs right now. I mean, we're going to lose a lot of battles, but that doesn't mean we stop fighting. And I, I, I do love this quote from Dr. King. This is from a letter uh, from a Birmingham jail where he says... I have almost reached the regrettable, regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the White Citizens Council or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefer, prefers a negative peace, which is an absence of tension, to a positive peace which is the presence of justice. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here watching what is happening around this country and around race. And there's this tension and, and, and you know, a group of folks that I know closely are, are, are part of this tension and enjoy this tension. But they're the ones who are already gone. They're the choir. There's this whole middle range of people who are uncomfortable with this tension and would rather see it go, go away. But without that tension, there's not going to be change. And we have to educate those in the middle who are uncomfortable with this tension that this is not right, this is not okay, this is not going to go away by simply having some coffee talk. That this tension is what drives change, and without this tension, we go nowhere, and poss quite possibly, we go backwards. We have to look at our fights on the local level, because I, 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 I don't expect anything from this federal government right now. But there are governors, and there are mayors, and there are state attorneys, who are pushing back and fighting and are going to make a difference and are going to hold the line. And we need to support those people. Look, they're not going to be perfect. We're not going to agree. I don't expect you to agree with everything your local state attorney wants to do. But if your state attorney is better than the one that was there before, I think that's a good thing. I think possibly working with her or him is a good thing. And we've heard that there are a number of really progressive state attorneys out there who are trying to do the right thing. We have to demand transparency and data. Because though some in the White House believe in a fact-free world, I don't. And I'm going to continue to fight and push to get those facts out there because they do matter. Right now, we have no idea why we incarcerate people for as long as we do. We have no idea what leads to recidivism and what doesn't lead to recidivism. We have no idea what leads to crime and doesn't lead to crime. And part of that problem is that our statistics, in the technical phrase, suck. They are awful. All of our criminal, our criminal justice statistics are some of the worst statistics that one can find. They are old, they are unaudited. New Orleans, we looked at New Orleans for a second. We, we, 
went in there, did a police investigation there. And one number that you can kind of draw some conclusions from is if your homicide rate is lower or your homicide number is lower than your sexual offense rate, that's usually saying you're not counting your sexual offenses. So New Orleans had this ridiculously low sexual offense rate. And we're like, New Orleans? That many drunk people? And there are like a dozen sexual assaults in a year? So we looked at it, and we went, and, and we started talking to advocates and everybody else, and started talking to police, and said, oh, no, we move a lot of those into our miscellaneous category. Okay, why? why? Well, it's New Orleans. We don't want to stop people from coming to New Orleans because they think there's going to be sexual assaults. And then we you know, dug in some more, and of course, the survivors told us how many times they were told by a police officer, oh, you don't want to do this. You're going to ruin the person's life. You've heard this already. You don't want to do this. It's going to be long. It's going to, this is going to be really tough. So one of the things we did in the consent decree is we said, you, you, you have to count your, se- your sexual offenses for real. And suddenly, the number of sexual offenses in New Orleans jumped up by it's probably like fivefold. Not a single person stopped going to New Orleans because they had more accurate numbers. But people whose lives were affected by sexual assault were actually counted. And that that matters. But you have to demand that. Our prosecutors' offices are the biggest black hole in our criminal justice system. And as Angela Davis noted, they are the most powerful players in our criminal justice system. Why? What right do they have not to say who they're prosecuting, what they're prosecuting people for, how long they're giving people in sentences, and disaggregate that by race, gender, religion. They have no right. And the only way they're going to start doing that is if we demand it of them. We have a few who are starting to, to, to nibble around the edges. But we have to demand that. And you know what? If race really matters the way I think it matters, the number one thing that we can all do is we can vote. Thank you very much.